Grab your Bible and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. What a wonderful, tremendous text this is. In fact, I preached on this text just a couple years ago, but I promise you, I have not exhausted it. Amen? This text is rich. One of the great texts in all the Bible. In fact, I can go ahead and just make a confession right here. I know I'm not the brightest bulb in the room, all right? There's a lot of things that I simply do not understand. I don't understand how a black cow with uh, brown spots can eat green grass and give white milk. I just don't understand that, friends. I don't understand this thing we call electricity, how it can travel through these very small wall, uh, wires and come into a room like this and make those lights to shine. I don't get it. In fact, I don't even understand how they can measure it to find out how much we've used. In fact, I don't even think they can figure it out. I think they just guess at it a lot of times. I don't understand what keeps these satellites from just floating off into space to you. I don't understand what makes the moon to come out every night and the sun to come up every morning. I don't understand a lot of things. I don't understand how my cell phone works. I don't understand how this internet stuff keeps popping up on my phone all the time. There's a lot of things that I simply do not understand. In fact, of all of the things, can I tell you probably the one thing that, that I'm most fascinated by that I don't understand? I don't understand why God would leave his eternal throne in glory, a perfect place where he's created absolutely everything perfect, everything he needs is right there. And he would get off of that throne and he would come to this world and live a sinless life and suffer and die on a cruel Roman cross to save me. That's a mystery. And you see, if that's what real love is, man, I may not understand it, but praise God, I can enjoy it, all right? And so this passage that we're going to look again at this morning teaches us that God knew everything about what was going to happen to the Lord Jesus Christ six or seven hundred years before he even came to this earth. So stand with me. I'd have been honored to read God's word. And I'm going to look at these two verses this morning. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. Watch this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform me. You know what this is? This is describing eternity's greatest event, which was written long before it ever came to pass. Father, God, I pray that somehow today you'll give us something fresh, something new, maybe that we've never thought about or even comprehended, but God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will come and interpret the truth to us in a way that we'll be receptive to it and that it'll make us different as a result of being here today. And we thank you and we give you praise for what you're about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, many historians would consider that the American Revolution was the greatest event to ever take place in the history of our nation. Shockwaves from that one event have, are still being felt today. Of course, that required a war that lasted from 1775 to 1783. But out of that came this free nation that we now call the United States of America. And out of that, many across our world today are, in, are enjoying God-given freedom simply that could not be experienced otherwise. No doubt, the American Revolution was a great event. 
in the history of America. Others believe that the day that an astronaut climbed down that ladder and touched his feet down on the surface of the moon, that that was history's greatest event. Even the President of the United States came out and proclaimed that that was the greatest event in the history of humanity. Well, all due respect to that president and all the other noted historians, but the greatest event that's ever taken place uh, was not when man fought in a war or even when man put, it, put his foot down on the surface of the moon, but it was when Almighty God came down and he worked and he walked upon the face of the earth. And that, my dear friend, is eternity's greatest event. When God stepped out of heaven and walked upon the earth, we call it the incarnation. We call it that Christmas morning. And I'm calling it eternity's greatest event. Eternity's greatest event was when God came to this earth in the form of a baby boy named Jesus. And by the way, as we kick the door open to this Christmas season, let me be quick to say that one thing that I've always loved and enjoyed about being a Southern Baptist is that it has been a regular part of our agenda to always recognize and to support the work of our missionaries across the planet. Amen? You see, Jesus commanded us. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach how many? All nations. Teaching them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. And then he came back again and reiterated in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. He said, you shall be. He didn't say you might be, you could be. He said, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and even unto the uttermost part of the earth. And that is the great commission that God has given to this church but it's also the great commission, listen to me carefully, that God has given to every single born again believer. Amen. Now I purposed in my heart a long time ago that I'm going to be a great commission Christian. And as a church, we have purposed in our hearts that we are going to be a great commission church. I'm just telling you, it's not up for debate. It's a settled issue. That's who we are. But when Jesus said to us to go into all the world, you know what I found out? I found out that that's impossible for me to do on my own. Because you see, God is God, but I'm not. And he has the ability to be everywhere at the same time, but I do not. I mean, I can go out into this city and I can go into this community. We did this last Sunday afternoon, as a matter of fact. And we can do that. We can tell the good folks all around us that Jesus saved. But listen, I can't go everywhere. I just can't do it. And so I've got a question. How is it possible that God would ever expect me to fulfill his great commission without making me like him? All right, listen, it is only through mission. You hear me? That's the only way. It is the supporting of foreign mission. And so today we're kicking off our week of prayer for international missions. And missions are especially appropriate, especially this time of the year during the Christmas season. Because listen to this, God only had one son. And he made him a missionary. Think about that for a little bit. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He only had one son and he made a missionary out of it. That's the good news that we're supposed to tell the world about. That's the good news that I'm going to concentrate on this morning. Eternity's greatest event was when God came to this world in the form of a baby. 
And may I say with all due respect to our most learned people around the world, to all of those who worship at the shrine of their computers and who get involved in these things like uh, cyclotrons and their musty, dusty tombs of history. Listen, if you don't understand Christmas, you don't have the key to knowledge. You don't have the key to all of history. How sad it would be to know biology, the study of life, and not know Jesus Christ, the giver of life. How sad it would be to study astronomy, the study of stars, and see how the heavens are formulated together and not know Jesus Christ, the bright and morning star, and how to go to heaven. How sad it would be to study geology and the Strait of Rocks and all the geological ages and not know Jesus Christ who is the rock of ages and to be able to say on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. How, how sad it would be to study botany, the study of flowers, and not know the robes of Sharon who can perfume every life. How sad it would be to claim to be educated and to know all of history from beginning to end and miss the most central event of all of history, which is the story of Jesus Christ. I want to say that a wise man is ignorant, a rich man is poor, a strong man is weak, until he knows Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Until he understands what Isaiah spoke about right here in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. It was six or seven hundred years before Jesus Christ was ever even born. He said, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now there's three natural divisions that come out of that brief verse. And all of them center around the Lord Jesus Christ. All of them focus on the story of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I never get tired of the Christmas story. I never get tired of talking about the day that the supernatural God of heaven came and gave us the glorious news. That same news that we need to be broadcasting around the world to our missionaries, to every nation, to every tribe, to every people on the earth. In fact, I'm so glad, aren't you? Somebody so fit, they were a missionary and they brought the good news to me. Thank God. I mean, I can stand up here with the songwriter of old and say, tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious was sweeter than ever I've heard. Well, chapter one in this wonderful story is what I call his supernatural nature. I want you to look at it. It's in verse six. He starts out, for unto us a child is born. And then he says, unto us a son is given. Now I hope you don't get the idea that he's being repetitive here. That's not a repeat of the same thought. Literally he's saying two completely different things at the same time. Unto us a child is born. That's talking about the humanity side of Jesus Christ. Unto us a, a son is given. That speaks of the deity of Jesus Christ. You see, when God sent us the greatest Christmas gift that's ever been given, you know what that gift was? That was the gift of himself. It was deity wrapped up in humanity. This was the first and the greatest Christmas gift of all time. And by the way, do you know, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus Christ did not have his beginning in Bethlehem? Y'all understand that? Listen, he came from the portals of glory. His mother was Mary, but his father was God Almighty. And she gave birth to God the Son. I'm talking about the majesty of the deity. Look at it again, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. Now, I, I just really, this is the part that I really gravitated toward this week. Because I got to study in that word in the Hebrew language that is translated here. Wonderful, Counselor. is a Hebrew word. The word is para-yote. Yo-yote. 
Pele Yoates, excuse me, Chuck. Pele Yoates. Now that's important for you to learn. Y'all write it down. Because that word Pele is a Hebrew word that is never used in Scripture to refer to human beings. It's a word that is always exclusively refers to Almighty God. For instance, over in Judges, there was a man there by the name of Manoah. And he had a wife, uh, uh, I'm just going to call her Mrs. Manoah. I don't know what her name was. But I know that Manoah, Miss Manoah, had a problem. The Bible said she was barren. That means she couldn't have any children. Now, nowadays, some people might view that as an advantage. But back in those days, they viewed it as a curse from God, as a judgment from God. And so she was depressed about it. She was very low because she couldn't have children. And she prayed and she prayed and she prayed and she prayed and prayed until finally she got to be an old woman. And here she is. She still doesn't have any child and still there's not even any hope of having a child. And she's just sick about it. She just hates it. But one day, Mrs. Manoa goes walking out into a field and lo and behold, she came face to face, eyeball to eyeball with an angel from heaven. And this angel says, Miss Manoa, you're married. She said, well, duh. <laughs> well, I know you already know that, the angel said, but do you know what, what, what you don't know is, even though you are well past the age of childbearing, you're about to conceive, and you're going to bear a son, and this son is going to bring deliverance to Israel. Of course, you've already learned about that son. You know what I'm talking about, right? You, this is Samson's parents, his mother we're talking about. And so you can understand how excited Miss Manoa was when she got the good news. She runs home. She wants to tell her husband about it. So she goes running in, Manoa, 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 Manoa. Guess what? I saw an angel. Nowadays, listen, you guys think about this for a moment. If, let's say your wife comes home from Christmas shopping this afternoon. And she comes running in there and she calls your name and, and she says, guess what? <coughs> I ran into an angel today. You're probably going to say, now, honey, you've been dipping into that barrel again. You gave him a little tipsy there, darling. What you been chewing on, a weed? <laughs> honey, I love you and all, but I perceive that you must be out of your mind. Because one thing's for sure, you know she ain't talking about you. <laughs> and that's what Manoah thought. She comes in, and she's been talking to an angel, and it ain't me. And he thought, I love her and all, but I know she's getting old, and her thoughts are starting to slip a little bit or something. I, now, he didn't say that. He knew better than to say that, right? And so he said, honey, in the unlikely event that you ever see this angel again, why don't you come and get me so that I can see him too? And the Bible says she just put that away inside of her heart. A few days later, she's out there walking in the field again, and guess what? Here comes that same angel, and he's going to reconfirm what the promise was. And she said, well, would you mind just hanging around here for a few minutes? I've got somebody that wants to meet you. And so she goes running back. That angel stayed right there. And she goes running back, and she gets Manoah. And when Manoah comes out, I want you to listen to what the angel said to Manoah. Listen, in Judges 13, 17, he says, What is thy name that thy sayings come to pass? We may do thee honor. This is what Manoah said to the angel. And in Judges 13, 18, the angel said, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Seeing it is secret. Now, folks, I told you all of that to simply say this. You see that word, Pella? that I told you about in Isaiah chapter 9 uh, and verse 6, this interpreted, wonderful, counseling, that's the same word for secret <coughs> right here in this text in Judges 13. And so I started scratching my head on that a little bit. I, uh, what's going on here? 
I mean, is it a secret or is it wonderful? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and infinitely more than all of that. It means that the transcendent God that you can't put your arms around. You see, you know who she ran into out there that day, Chuck? It was none other than the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Now, folks, y'all understand. Let me reiterate it again. Jesus did not have his beginning in Bethlehem. Don't ever make that mistake. I don't care what those two little guys in them white shirts with them little ties riding their bicycles come up to your house and want to tell you. Listen, he did not begin in Bethlehem. That's just a fact. That's just when he took on human flesh and became a man. But listen, he was already the Lord God Almighty. He's the Son of God from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. And by the way, y'all remember that other time when Nebuchadnezzar had the three Hebrew boys thrown into the fiery furnace? It was almost a thousand years before Mary and Joseph were ever born. He threw old Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into a burning, fiery furnace. But when he went over to look into the fire, he said, something's going wrong here. I, somebody's going to have to help me. I, I just don't understand this new man. He said, let's see, we threw three guys, three guys in there, and one plus one plus one now equals four. How does that happen? And he said, in the fourth of... The form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. So who did he see in there? You see, when you get thrown into the burning fiery furnace in life, that's exactly, uh, that's not always a bad thing, you know, when you get thrown into a burning fiery furnace because that's an opportunity for Jesus to really show up in your life. And do something supernatural. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar saw there in the burning fiery furnace. And I'm saying, listen, that word hella means the wonderful one. It means the secret one. The awesome one. The incredible one. The transcendent one. You see, it's the one that we can't fully understand. But he reveals himself to us at certain times, special times in our life. So... Let's go back on this. Look at it. Who is this child? Who is this Messiah? I tell you who he is. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Pele Yoes. The wonderful, transcendent, awesome, and secret counselor from heaven. I'm talking about the majesty of his deity. And friends, someday, I'm just going to warn you now, you're going to need that counselor to show up in your life. You're going to need him to come and minister to you. There's going to be a time in your life, if he hadn't already come, when there's no human word that's going to help you in your time of sorrow. There's going to be a day, if it hadn't come already, when you're going to face a situation where no human voice, no matter how many degrees they've got following their name, no matter what kind of a setup they've got in their office, you're going to need the Pele That is, you're going to need the wonderful counselor, the one who speaks with the voice of God. And that's exactly who this child is. My grandmother's with the Lord today that I'll never forget. The day when I got a telephone call that my grandmother had had a heart attack. I hadn't been pastor of this church for very long. And I, I guess in my mind, I really knew better. But in my heart, I always sort of thought my grandmother was going to always be there. And I just couldn't imagine a day when she wasn't going to be there in my life. And you can imagine how I felt on the inside when I, felt, when I found out that now she was in intensive care. And so I took off. I went down to the hospital and I was told that the doctors were in there. They were working with her and that her heart had literally stopped beating. And that they literally, uh, they got her re going again. They got her heart to work again, but they had to elevate her feet up high so that the blood would naturally flow back to her brain. Her sons were there when I got there. Her daughters, my mother was there. And I asked my uncle, I said, what did the doctor say? And I didn't like his answer. 
He said the doctor said that there's some blockages in one of the valves going into her heart. And, and surgery at her age is a very high risk because you see she was 84 years old at the time and the doctors just didn't feel very comfortable performing the surgery and yet on the other, on the other hand she just didn't have much of a chance of making it without it. And so my uncle says right away, he said, she's been asking for you. And since I was a pastor, I went on right back into the back part of the ICU where she was. And when I walked into the room, I'll never forget the look on her face. She had a terrified look. And she looked up at me and she said, Gene, I'm glad you're here. Pray, pray for me. And she said these words, I'm not ready to die. Over and over again, she told me, I'm not ready to die. And I remember I got down by that bedside and I called on the one, the only one that I knew could really ever do anything. Can I tell you who he was? He was the Pele Yohei. And I called on him and he came into that room and I looked at my grandmother after feeling, finding and feeling her, his presence. And I said, all I know is this, everything's gonna be all right. I just know it. And I went back out into that waiting room and together with the family, we circled up and we held hands and we prayed. We prayed, oh Lord, oh Lord God, we love that woman. We really love her, but we know you love her more than we do. And we trust in you. We know that you're always right. And you know what happened? The Pele Yohes showed up again. He paid another visit into that waiting room. Emmanuel came, God with us. And he showed up and he made a visitation upon our lives that day. Oh, listen, I didn't see anything visible. I didn't, I, it wasn't something that somebody knocked me out with. There was no audible voice. I want to tell you though, it was a whole lot more real than that. The Lord God, the wonderful counselor, stepped into that room and he began to comfort our hearts with truth. The doctors had no choice. They told us they had to go ahead and perform the surgery. But it wasn't but just a little bit. And that doctor came back out. He had perspiration on his face. And he looked awful nervous, if you ask me. And he said, you know, I really can't explain it. But I went in there. And as I started making my way in, the arteries just opened up. That's what he said. Now, friends, you can say whatever you want to, but I can stand and testify the truth. My grandmother lived another 12 years after that. Hey, let me tell you something. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget the moment when I knelt down beside of her bed and the Pele Yahweh began to show up. I want to tell you something today. If you've never had a meeting with a wonderful counselor, that's one thing that, that can turn your world inside out. That's one thing that can change everything in your life. It's one thing that will literally change your life forever. Woo. That's the majesty of his deity. A son is given. But I want you to also see the majesty or the mystery of his humanity. A child is born. Now I love the way John Philip said this. He said the great mystery of the manger is that God should be able to translate deity into humanity without discarding the deity or distorting the humanity. Isn't that a beautiful statement? And so... That little baby who was laid in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes is the great God who created the universe. The little baby of Luke chapter 2 is the great God of Genesis chapter 1. The little tiny toddler that was growing up in Joseph's carpenter shop playing with those shavings is the same God that created the tree in the first place. And I'm telling you, friends, God became flesh. You say, I don't understand that. Well, I'd be ashamed of you if you said you could understand it. I would. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Without great controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. You see, here's what I'm talking about here this morning, the supernatural. 
What we're talking about is really a miracle from God, a great mystery. It's something that only God can do. The miracle of the ages is the virgin conception of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 9, 6 tells about his coming, but Isaiah 7, 14 talks about his conception. The Bible says, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and be with child. You say that's impossible. How can a virgin conceive? In fact, that's exactly what Mary said to the angel, isn't it? To, and what did the angel say in response? To, he let her know up front what was going to happen. The angel said, this is what's going to happen to you. Mary says, well, how can this thing be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel said, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Friend, don't tell me that you're having problems with a virgin birth. Because, listen, if you're having problems believing the virgin birth, in reality, your problems are really in just you believing God. That's right. I mean, why do we have any difficulty in believing that God could cause a woman to conceive a child in her womb without, without a man being involved? Why do we have any difficulty believing that God could bring a man child into this world without an earthly father? How do you think that God brought the first man into this world in the first place? Listen, he did that without a mother or a father. You don't think he can do it again? Listen, if you could ever just read Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, if you could believe that one verse, you won't have any problems with anything else that takes place in the Word of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Don't tell me it's a biological impossibility if you doubt the virgin birth or if you discard the virgin birth. My dear friend, you're taking the very cornerstone out of our Christianity. I'm telling you that the greatest event that's ever taken place in, in, in eternity's history was when God became a virgin, came through a virgin, and he, would, he came through the portals of a virgin's womb into this world. If you doubt the virgin birth, the humanity of Jesus or the deity of Jesus, let me tell you the kind of difficulty you had. First, you have difficulty with the character of the Word of God. You just don't believe God's Word. It's just that simple. Because if Jesus were not virgin born, then that means that he was a descendant of Adam. And my Bible says in Adam, all die. That means that Jesus would be a sinner by nature and a sinner by practice if he were not born of a virgin. But I'll tell you something else. If you don't believe the virgin birth, you've got uh, difficulties with uh, Mary's character. If Jesus were not virgin born, that means he was, she was in sin. And out, he was born out of wedlock. You also have uh, problems with Jesus' character. You also have difficulty with your character. That's right, your character. Because listen, the Bible says, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believed not the record that God gave of his son. You see, there is no hope apart from the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Do y'all understand that? You see, when Jesus came, as he did, virgin born, to be what he was, sinless. He was what he was, sinless. To do what he did, die for our sins as a sinless substitute. So he did what he did that we might be who we are, sons and daughters of God, right? By faith in what he did for us on the cross at Calvary. And so let me just try to make this simple. No virgin birth means no sinless Christ. No sinless Christ means no atonement. No atonement means... No forgiveness. No forgiveness means we have no hope of heaven. No hope of heaven, and my dear friend, you're going to die and go to hell. Are y'all all right? Don't tell me the virgin birth is not important. 
Thank God for the virgin birth. You see, if you take away the virgin birth, then all of Christianity collapses like a house of cards. Uh, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. But not only a supernatural nature, I want you to see also his sovereign nobility. Look at verse 6. It says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That means that he's a noble. It means that he's a ruler. It means that he is sovereign. He came not only to redeem. Listen, he also came that one day he will reign. He was born to be a king. The government will be upon his shoulder. Now look at what it says in verse 7. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom in, to order it and to establish is with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. You see, he came the first time to redeem us. But he's coming the second time to rule and to reign over us. And his first coming is, is different from his second coming. His second coming is also just as certain as his first coming. When he comes the second time, he's coming as a little baby. But he's also going to come as a, uh, or when he's not coming as a little baby the second time, he's coming as a mighty monarch, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. You see, every once in a while, some preacher will get to preaching and go stretch out the hands to the congregation and say something like this. Why don't you make Jesus Lord today? And I know I probably said something like that myself. But the truth of the matter is, you're too late for that. He's already Lord. The only thing you can do now is recognize His Lordship and bow down before Him as King. You see, the cradle and the cross and the crown are inevitably woven together. An excited crowd could come and dance around a manger and love on a little baby. But my dear friend, we're not just called to be excited about a little baby and to bow down before him. But we are to crown him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords because the government shall be upon his shoulder. Well, there's one more thing and I'll be finished. Not only his supernatural nature and his sovereign nobility, but I want you to notice his saving name. His saving name. Look at verse 6. And his name shall be called Wonder. Now you know what his name is, right? In Matthew 1, 21, he was named by God the Father. The angel said, thou shalt call his name what? Y'all don't know? Thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sin. You see, Mary didn't make that up. They didn't get out one of these little name books and go down through there and try to figure it out. Joseph didn't figure it out. That name was given to them. What does the name Jesus mean? Now this is very important. That wonderful name. Actually, it's a compound name name. It's a compound word. It means Jehovah saves. Now listen. Jehovah is the most sacred name for God in all of the Old Testament. And it means the great I am. That's who it is. And so now Jesus takes that name I am upon himself. In fact, he made seven great I am statements in the book of John alone. Just as he told his distractors and his critics before Abraham was, I am. Of course, that's when they took up stones to kill him, didn't they? Because they didn't like him calling himself, I'm the great I am. I am the Jehovah who saves. Now listen, let me tell you what it means. It means that he is both the son of God, but he is also God the son. He's just as much God as, he was, as if he was not man at all and as much man as if he was not God at all. Because the name Jesus means Jehovah saved. And that's the reason that the prophet Isaiah said his name shall be called Wonderful. What wonder it is that this baby would be named Jesus, Jehovah saved. 
He was wonderful in his birth. He was wonderful in life. He was wonderful in his works. He was wonderful in his words. He was wonderful in death and in his resurrection. He was wonderful in his ascension and his intercession. But I want to tell you, he's just flat wonderful. Amen? And when he comes again, wonder of wonders. And he is coming again, by the way. And so, first of all, his name is wonderful. There's wonder in his name. But his name is also counselor. There's wisdom in his name. Do you see it there? Thou shalt call his name wonderful counselor. He is the counselor. He is the one who gives you wisdom. True wisdom always comes from God. How are you supposed to live? How are you supposed to learn? How are you supposed to know what to do? Well, it's all wrapped up in following Jesus Christ. Amen? Colossians 2, 3 says, In Jesus are all the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There's wonder in His name. There's wisdom in His name. Somebody says, yeah, but pastor, I don't know if I even need it. Oh, really? Well, let me ask you something. What has the last 6,000 years of human history brought about with man's wisdom? How have we ever somehow gotten to a place where we're passing out condoms in our high school? How have we gotten to a place where murderers can come running into our homes at night? Where our world is plagued with all kinds of sexually transmitted diseases? Somebody said, well, we just don't know what to do anymore. i tell you what we better do. We better learn to live according to this book. We better be a follower of Jesus Christ. But, oh, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that, do we? Because like it or not, the world we're living in today as a whole has rejected the wisdom of God. Even America has become a foolish nation again. You see, my dear friend, there is wonder in this name. There is wisdom in this name. But even further than that, notice he is called the mighty God. Do you see it there in your Bible? Jesus, this baby child shall be called the mighty God. That simply means there's wealth. In his name. He is the almighty God. It all belongs to him. Listen I'm telling you. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And he owns the hills. His resources are not depleted. His storehouses are still full. Because remember. He said all power. Is given into me in heaven and on earth. You see Jesus Christ. Is the one. Who made it all. That means as the mighty God, He's created everything that's ever been created and without Him was not anything made that's ever been made. Billions of suns have been flung from His hand. Oceans have dripped from His fingertips. He's made everything in the world that's ever been made. Everything in the universe, Jesus made it. Do you ever go out on a starlit night and you begin to gaze up to realize just how small you really are? And it all came to pass. Everything you see at the very hand of the Lord Jesus. You know why? Because He, my friend, is the Almighty God. I'm telling you, there's wonder in His name. There is wisdom in His name. There's wealth in that name. He is the mighty God. But I'll tell you something else. There ought to be worship in that name. Do you see what it says? He is the everlasting Father. He is the everlasting Father. He is the one who can say that I and the Father are one. He that has seen me has seen the Father. You remember that time when Jesus, we were talking about it, Chuck, when he went walking through the wall and, and, and he showed up in the upper room. It was after the resurrection. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. You remember what he said? He said, now, have I been with you so long that you still don't know who I am, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Listen, this little baby is the everlasting father. And that's why 
He deserves our worship. In fact, you listen to me this morning. If Jesus Christ is not God, listen, listen. If Jesus Christ is not God, we have no business worshiping him at all. Amen. You know why? That would make it idolatry. If he's not God, it's idolatry. Anytime you worship anyone other than Almighty God, God said, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. But there's wealth in that name. There's wonder in that name. There's wisdom in that name. There's worship in that name. But he doesn't stop there. He says he's the prince of peace. In other words, there's welcome in that name. Just as Jesus said, come unto me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you peace. You say, but doesn't the Bible promise us that we're going to have peace on the earth? Listen to me. Listen to me carefully. There will be no peace. Not yet. But one day there will be. Only when Jesus comes again. I heard about this man. He died. and They put a beautiful tombstone and engraved something special. His wife spent all of her money doing it. And she put these words, rest in peace. And then she went to the lawyer's office and read the will and found out he didn't leave her anything. So she went back and had some other words added on. Till I come. Friend, I want to tell you something. This world is not going to know any peace till Jesus comes. But when he comes, he is the Prince of Peace. But oh, let me tell you, let me tell you, even in a world like what we're living in now, even in a world of turmoil, there can be personal peace. That peace with God, that peace like a river that Isaiah talked about. A river, you see, always comes from a higher source. It's beautiful. It overflows. It just keeps on coming. In fact, I want to tell you, I've experienced that peace like a river. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because there is welcome. Welcome in His name. That wonderful name. See, I'm speaking to some today and oh you're wondering what in the world is all this about well let me just summarize all this again for you listen carefully let me tell you what christmas is all about here it is unto us a child is born unto us a son is given that's his supernatural nature god came to this earth to live and to breathe and to work and to laugh and to cry and to weep and to teach and to carry our sin to the cross. That's his supernatural nature. His sovereign nobility is he is Lord. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Pastor, do you think Jesus would save me? Oh, yes, he will. Yes, he will. He will if, and there's an if, if you'll trust him. He will if. He'll come into your heart. If, if, if you'll say. If you'll ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. And to save you. I promise you on the authority of the word of God. If you'll trust him. And repent of your sin. He'll save you. You know what I'm convinced of? People need the Lord. People need Jesus. Who needs him? There's people all over this world today that needs the Lord. That's why we're having our week of prayer for international missions. There's people all over the world that need the Lord. That's why we're building a church in Dung Thao, Vietnam Forum. They need your prayers. Listen, they need your support in every way. Who needs the Lord? I want to tell you there's people in our community. There's people within the shadow of our steeple that need the Lord Jesus Christ today. They need to have somebody to tell them the good news that Jesus saves. But you know what? There might even be somebody in here today. And in your own little way, you need the Lord. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And you know what this is? This is invitation time. And Jesus says, come. Come unto me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden, and you shall find rest unto your soul. Come to Jesus. Let's stand for prayer. Father, Lord, I pray that as the Holy Spirit has spoken to our heart that we'll simply be receptive and allow you to penetrate our lives. And, and Lord, whatever you told us, whatever you've shown each of us today, I pray that we'll respond in the appropriate manner. Lord, if you've challenged us to come to you, I pray that we'll do that. Lord, whatever it is that you're speaking to us about, help us to be obedient. Help us to have the courage to come before the throne of grace that we can obtain the help we need in times of trouble. Whatever it is, God, I pray that you'll draw us to yourself and we'll love you and thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. few people that are still out I know that there's a lot of sickness going on in our church family so you be in prayer for them and also give them a call and let you know let them know you missed them uh, Chuck Stewart is standing up here and he has got a lot of barbecue tickets and you need to get yours uh, and so he stop by and see Chuck today's the day that we're kicking off our support for uh, world